Thank you. This is a great room. I was joking with my colleagues. I'm like, I'm just going to have three people in the room, and, and one of them, you better not fall asleep. Uh, but thank you for all showing up, first and foremost. Again, uh, Mike Destine, um, unless you're uh, my mom and I'm mad at me, you call me Michael. Uh, but yes, I'm with Talend. Uh, been in the data integration business pretty much my entire career. I'm not going to uh, tell you how old I am, but uh, I did start with you know ODBC or if any of you are really old, you might know Borland Database Engine. That was the original product manager for that. So I go back in data integration quite a bit, and you know I, you know I started as a programmer. So so even though the title of this is stop coding, I, I do love coding. Okay, so let's I want to make that clear. But the thing that happens is when I work with customers and working with as as talent from a data integration perspective. What we're, we're hearing a lot of these types of benefits, these ROI benefits, twice the value at half the cost, 50x cheaper per gigabyte of data managed. These are important numbers. And they're important because as organizations start to adopt AI and machine learning, the thing that we see holding it back is productivity, finding the people that can do the job and do it well and continue to do that from a maintenance and, and operational perspective. Okay, so the common thread here is that all of these customers that I'm going to talk about are, are utilizing a modern data engineering approach. And I'll talk about what that means in specific in just a moment. Okay, but those things are developer agility. How can I make my developers more productive, have them do more in the time frame that's allotted with less people and do more projects? but not at the cost of, of, of losing capabilities. So being able to, to be able to look at the different data processing engines. Okay, today we're at Spark AI and Databricks is, the, is kind of the, the key Spark you know, provider. How do you leverage that technology? Well, what if I was still have some on-prem technology that I want to use Spark? And what's going to come after Spark? Okay, so, this, so that portability is going to be important. And last is, as I kind of alluded to, some, something will come after Spark. Something came before it, and that's the way of things. And so being able to continuously modernize without having to rewrite code. So again, I love coding, okay? I don't, wanna, I don't want you to think that coding is a bad thing. There's gonna be parts of, of a data processing job where you are gonna need to code. There might be some function that just does not exist or is very unique to your process or your industry. And so being able to put that in either as a library in, in, into, the, into your data flow or to be able to code that yourself is going to be important. But there's a lot of that job that you don't need to repeat and redo because it's already been invented. Okay? So, you know, so let's talk about you know, what are some of the myths from hand coding. Okay? First of all, you know, the thing that we hear the most is, no, we can do it with less. Okay? We can do it you know, for less money. And yes, there is a cost of, to buying our tools, but the cost outweighs the savings that you're going to get from a productivity perspective. So being able to you know, rapidly de deploy those jobs and maintain them over time, I think you know, you're going to see that it is, you're, you're going to save far more money by using a, a modern data engineering approach. Okay. The other thing I hear a lot is, no, no, our programmers are the best. We can optimize it better than you can. Okay. Okay, but how can you constantly upskill that team? And I would actually challenge to say, do a head-to-head -head comparison. Okay? The code that we generate and, and be able to, to create is going to actually be far more performant in most cases. Yes, there are going to be cases where the programmer can do some things that are a little different and be better, but ultimately the question then becomes, at what cost? Okay? We can hire the talent. Okay? This, this, this conference is filled with you know, experienced Java, experienced Spark, experienced Scala programmers. Okay, you are out there, okay? but, but where, are, where are all these people and can you find them as an organization in your region, in your city, for your company, for your industry? So again, having fewer people that can do more can solve this problem. And also, you know, being, being on the cutting edge. And we'll talk about this from the, the portability and, and some of the capabilities that a modern data engineering tool can provide. But can you keep the pace? You know, the, one of the, you know, one example I heard uh, uh, a couple years back, a company was using MapReduce, a big, a large banking firm, spent millions of dollars in, you know, developing something in MapReduce. And then Spark came along. And when Spark came along, they're like, wow, that's a better way of handling it. Okay. But the development teams didn't know Spark, so how did they keep up? <coughs> I 
being able to have some portable uh, technologies, being able to say, I don't want to use MapReduce anymore, I want to use Spark, and just change some configuration parameters gives you that ability to you know, take advantage of the cutting edge. And lastly, you know, da data governance, we don't need that right now. We'll add that after the project becomes successful. Well, whoever gets time to go back and add data governance to a successful project, let alone one that's only moderately successful. So being able to add those things right in at the core without having to you know, think about it and spend extra programming time to do it, you, know, what, you can add that without having to wait. Okay? So ultimately, it's do you want to work in a agile, productive, use UI kind of graphical way of designing those data flows and configuring it with parameters? Or do you want all this code? Okay. This is self-documenting. This creates an easy maintenance where I can change some things. If I want, you know, again, like, oh yeah, I need to add some code. This one, I can add some Python code in there. But there's other steps that are easily, uh, excuse me, there's other steps that are um, often used and you can just re reuse those capabilities versus again, you know, having to navigate through code. So manageability, maintenance, productivity. Okay, let's hear from a customer that's, that did that. Petabytes of data total. And since we've begun our big data journey, our big data footprint alone is three petabytes. We think that the more information you have, the more hypotheses that you can develop, and ultimately the better discoveries that you can make. We are seeing the business get interested in understanding predictive analytics about the customer, artificial intelligence, machine learning. Regarding, we're starting to develop competencies in understanding how to predict and anticipate what our customers will need and uh, deliver a decision and a recommendation via digital channel. The IT benefits are significant. We see that the cost of delivery for our data is somewhere on the order of 50x cheaper per gigabyte. What we're also seeing with the use of Talon is a massive reduction in cost of delivery for our data transformations, the order of about $13 million in cost avoidance. People need to get their hands on data and tools today, right now. I have a question, I want to answer it right now. That requires a lot of elasticity. There's no other way to do it than via the cloud. It really allows us to give a lot of different people access to the data and the tools that they need on demand. We're now able to do lots of innovative things in the lake. Our speed of delivery has increased dramatically and we're able to deliver solutions in a fraction of the time and a fraction of the cost. Well, fraction of the time, fraction of the cost, speed of delivery. Okay. So, when we talk about you know, the second part of our portable data processing, okay, let me just kind of set the stage here of, of well, what I really mean by this. Okay. When somebody asks me, what, you know, what does Talon do? Uh, but, you know, my answer is, we move data. Okay. We move it from a source to a target so that somebody can consume it. And we do, and we do that with a data processing engine. Okay. So that data processing engine, what's that going to do? That's going to connect to that source. It might and improve the quality of the data. You might you know, do some other things around transforming it and restructuring it before you deliver it into that target. Okay? Those sources obviously have some sort of computing platform. I'm not going to talk too much about the sources computing platform, but rather the data processing engine. Today, when we talk about Databricks, the, the computing infrastructure is going to be a cloud, AWS or Azure. Okay? Same with the target. It's going to have a computed infrastructure and so on. So when I think of, you know, when I talk to our customers, what are you trying to do? I'm trying to answer these questions. What data do you want to get? Where do you want to move it to? Who wants to consume it? And what do I need to do to the data before delivering it there? So let me give you a couple examples. So just a traditional data, you know, data integration example. I've got Salesforce data. I want to put that into a Snowflake data warehouse, but I need to improve the quality and, and change the structure of the data. I'm going to do that in Databricks. And I'm going to review all of that in Looker. And you know, Salesforce runs on their own cloud. You know, Databricks on AWS. And you might have, you know, Snowflake and Looker out on Azure. Okay? So that's, I would say, as a traditional data integration example. This, this is kind of the, you know, basic data warehousing 101 from an ETL perspective. Okay? Another example might be more of a data lake or data science example. I don't really need to move the data around so much. I've got it in Amazon S3. I, I just need to curate the data. Maybe I'm taking raw data and, and creating some curated data so that the business users can use it, and I'm going to put it back in S3, and then the business user is a data scientist, and they're going to be using Jupyter Notebooks to work on that data. Okay? So two very different examples of you know, target and source and data processing, but it's still that same sort of model. Source to target, process the data, use the data. Okay? So what are other data processing options? 
Okay, these are the things that you're gonna have to think about. Do I wanna do ETL, extract, transform, and then load? Or do I wanna do extract, load, and then transform once it's in the data environment? Am I gonna do this on-prem? Is it gonna be a hybrid environment? Am I gonna use an IPaaS approach or a software as a service approach? Am I gonna do, use Java Runtime or Spark or Hive on Pez? And, or, or, and if I'm gonna use Spark, which Spark engine am I gonna use? These are all choices that the data engineer has to make. And it's very possible that in a large organization, all of these things are at play in different projects. So when you look at data integration, you have to look at it in a way that you also look at your cloud provider. Not for one single use case, but what data integration technology is gonna help me span multiple use cases? Again, multiple sources, multiple targets, multiple processing engines. And I wanna be able to do that, you know, have the same logic that maybe today I'm doing it in an on-prem Spark environment, but next, you know, the next six, seven months, we wanna move that to a cloud environment. Do I, how, do I, how do I move that code around? Okay? So being able to have a portable environment where you're just changing the parameters, and today, I'm, I'm using, maybe I'm using MapReduce in, you know, in an on-prem environment, and I want to change that to Spark in Databricks. Okay? If you can change that simply by saying, I'm not going to MapReduce anymore, I'm going to, to, to Databricks, here's my cluster, here's my user credentials, push the button, push it out and go. Okay? It should be that easy, and if, in a portable environment, you're able to do that. Let's hear from a customer that did that. Lenovo is a $40 billion company. We're the, one of the largest uh, device makers in the world, and we make products ranging from servers to personal laptops, desktops, uh, and mobile phones. Customer sentiment, customer experiences is a huge important aspect. So how many customers say that they really like our, our T450S product? You know, what do the customers really think about our server products? The problem that we have right now is really a great big data problem. When you have billions of rows of information, how do you aggregate that up? How do you take that information? Talon became a very core component of this big data architecture. We decided to actually do a hybrid architecture of Amazon Web Services and our Lenovo servers. Lucy Sky is our big data hybrid elastic platform uh, that helps us to do real-time um, operational analytics on top of our data sets. Uh, totally, we have 60 different data sources coming in uh, uh, into our platform every single day. Uh, some of the data sources are like web data sets. When you get into our Lenovo.com, we gather the social information, what you talk about Lenovo on the, on the internet, what, what are the comments that you're giving to us. Gather a lot of chat logs, uh, uh, customer support logs. So we basically house around uh, 11 billion transactions annually and that keeps growing every every single year. We have a capability to house around uh, six to eight terabytes of data in memory. So we have this big data environment. What does it actually solve for us? We've been able to do some really great analysis. One of those analysis is the, the conjoint analysis where you take 5,000 different combinations per device uh, and we're able to, to find what devices and configurations customers most care about. Through that exercise, we were able to actually drive up uh, a revenue per unit by 11%. Over the last three years, since we've switched over to this big data platform, we've been able to reduce our costs by a million dollars and by 34%, uh, as well as get a 2.3x increase in our productivity. So a good example of being able to use different technologies, hybrid environment, and not, it's not always gonna be all cloud or all on-prem. Okay, the next thing is continuous modernization. Okay, we've, you know, you look at MapReduce and, you know, Kafka and 18 important, you know, Hadoop file systems. Okay, these are important technologies and they are still important. Okay, but we're also seeing, you know, Spark and Snowflake and Azure and Databricks and so forth. This is a progression. Okay, one example from a, uh, one of our customers is the progression that they've made. Okay, they started in 2007 using access databases and they were just doing basic reporting for a few people. Okay. The data volumes have gone up. The use cases have gotten more complex. The user audience that are, it's interacting is getting broader, and the technologies are changing. Okay. The same jobs can be, you know, we're taking from Access to MySQL, to Teradata, to on-prem Hadoop, and then Spark, and then Redshift, and then CloudSpark. It's a, it's a modernization approach, but you're not having to redevelop and recode again. Okay, again, because you've used that graphical model that defines the flow, and you've changed the parameters to modernize the, the underlying architecture. 
And so it's very easy to, to continue and grow and replatform. And this customer was replatforming every three to five years. So, but still using talent in the same job definitions in, in, that, in, in these new environments. And let's hear from them. HP Inc. has uh, two major businesses. Uh, we have print and we have personal systems. So we have a lot of graphics, uh, graphic printing, and now heading towards 3D printing. On the personal system side, we are seeing a huge shift where the commercial and consumer businesses are merging. The program that we have, we call it Kai. It is to build a new enterprise data warehouse. We are laying out the foundation for all future transformation program uh, data, the whole data landscape for that. We have almost 300 systems feeding us data and we are feeding them the data. The ecosystem is uh, a mix of systems which are in our data centers and rapidly moving to SaaS solutions. So they are either in cloud, like Amazon and Azure, or they are packaged SaaS solutions, Workday, Dynamics. We need to connect to multiple clouds, we need to connect to multiple SaaS solutions, and we need to connect to on-prem. We loved really Talent because it allows us to build it more in a graphic user interface and generate code, which can change as the technology changes. Okay. So good example. Okay, migrate your or migrate your jobs, but don't have to rewrite the code. Okay. So that's it. Developer agility. You know, give your developers that that you know the productivity advantage. Portable data processing. Let them pick the data engine, the data processing engine that is most appropriate to that job, and modernize continuously so that you can you know grow with them and without having to do rewrites. So, give your data engineering team a mod or give your team a modern data engineering environment. Okay, we have a demonstration of this at our booth, uh, at booth 409, so come see us for that. Other than that, I'll open it up for questions. The runtime? Yeah, so the question is, how do, you, how do you compare performance from you know, hand coding to what we generate? We've done a number of benchmarks that, you know, to kind of show that. Uh, I think what you'll find is that the performance is gonna be better or on par with hand coding. There might be a few corner cases where, where somebody can eke out a little bit more through hand coding, but again, the question then becomes, at what cost of, of having to do all of that? All right, everyone, let's give Michael a big hand. <laughs>